Hey everybody, Michael June here with Game Changers for Government Contractors. And today I have Nick with us. Nick, I want you to hop in and tell everybody a little bit about who you are and what you do. Well, hey, Mike, thanks for the opportunity. I'm president and owner of MyGovWatch.com, and we operate a bid notification and matching tool that we feel is rather unique in the marketplace. Several years ago, we realized that there was a sort of a vacuum in the market for telling people which leads were out there. You sort of have, you know, a very low end part of the market where for 30 bucks a month or 40 bucks a month, you can hear about leads, but terrible interface and not great coverage. And then at the other end of the market, we saw that there were providers out there charging five, seven, ten, even twenty thousand dollars per year, often with data that is valuable for companies that can take action with that data. But we saw that there was a very large cohort of companies that would never spend twenty thousand dollars for data about which government RFPs are coming up, but may spend $1,000 per year to hear about things that are happening now in real time because they may not have the sales infrastructure or the ability to act on some of the higher end tools that some of the legacy providers have. So that's what we're trying to be, Mike. We're trying to be in the sweet spot of cost versus value for government RFPs and information. That's awesome. And I think the challenge for a lot of people is exactly what you said. It's either 30 bucks a month or 10 grand a year. For a lot of people, they can't afford it. And, you know, using SAM, which is one of the first things we're going to talk about here, using SAM for a lot of people is just a nightmare. I've been very vocal for a while about the dumpster fire that is SAM. I thought a couple of months ago, I was going to say, hey, maybe they're starting to put the fire out and then something stupid happened. I was like, come on, man. I was just getting on the bandwagon because when, when the new rollout happened, happened and, and, you know, the consolidation of the data bank and everything. I'm like, I'm going to be a champion of this, right? And I still like a lot of components to it, but the average person struggles to use it. They really do. And that's actually been my probably biggest complaint about some of the really big products on the market, the ones you're talking about, the, the 10, 15 grand a year, the Cadillacs, if you will, is I log in and I'm like, are you kidding me? When was the last design of this? Was it in the nineties? Because the design is, is so cumbersome that I've logged in and thought, I can't figure out how to use this thing. It's just too hard. They're not necessarily like Salesforce where Salesforce has so many bells and whistles, you get lost. It's like, I just don't get it. My little soapbox on some of the tools that are out there and, and my challenges. Why don't we dive in today and start off, you know, because we were going to talk about some differences in the Fed sled market, who's buying what you're selling, because I think it's really important for people to be able to identify that. It's probably our biggest mantra is who buys what you sell. You'll hear Josh and I talk about that all the time. Most people are going to start with Sam. So what are some of the biggest misconceptions about Sam? Probably one of the biggest misconceptions about Sam is that it's a database of all government purchasing. So mm. first and foremost, it's not that. It's not even the only database or the only way to find out about federal purchasing, as I'm sure you know. You can certainly find the lion's share or the largest percentage of federal opportunities on SAMGOV. But, you know, for example, if you're in the printing business or if you make signs, you better know about the U.S. Government Publishing Office website because that's the only place you're going to find their opportunities. As another example, you know, there's eBuy, you have government purchasing that is below the simplified acquisition threshold or the micro purchase threshold. I guess the other thing about SAM is that it's not solely about contracting opportunities, right? When you think about the word SAM, it's, it's really a great acronym and kudos to whoever came up with it for Uncle Sam and the connection there, but the award concept, right? And so people can be awarded a contract, but they can also be awarded a grant and they could also be awarded disaster relief. They could be awarded you know, a loan from the SBA. And so you simply cannot have any of these things unless you are on SAMGOV and contracting opportunities is just one of those things. Another misconception, Mike, I would say is that, you know, the system will just notify you whenever something comes up that's relevant to you. And that's just not the case or that you can just simply type in what you do, whether you're an ac accountant or if you're in IT or if you sell widgets and you'll just find everything that you need. And it's just not the case. And I'm, I'm sure you can comment on or echo some of these sentiments. Absolutely. We were playing around the other day with the follow an opportunity little button that's in there now because you, know, you used to be able to do the interested vendor and things like that. And you could set up some searches. We can't even get the follow this opportunity to work all the time. There's so many bugs in it right now. That's probably my biggest complaint. It is still, in my mind, beta mode. 
it should still have the beta in front of it, even though it's live. It should be beta.sam.gov just because like there's so many things that are broken at this point, which again, got to use it for certain things. I like using certain parts of it. I will use it for some of my research, but that lends into kind of what you were saying there is it's not the end all be all. So even if I'm doing research, I don't just do research there. I mean, how many websites do you think the average person has to visit just to get like a full picture of what's going on for who buys what they sell? If you're struggling with your government contracting business, I want to encourage you today to go sign up for a free coaching session with me. You can go in the description of this podcast. There's a link to my calendar and you can go pick a time where we can sit down for 30 minutes, talk about what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong, what you should change. And then if coaching makes sense for you, I'll actually go over the options on how you can get started with coaching so we can take your business to the next level. Now let's get back into this episode. That uh, answer is going to differ whether you are only interested in federal contracting. That would be one use case. Another would be if you're interested in state and local nationally. Another would be, let's say you're a regional company and for whatever reason you have a service area that's defined by a region, or you may be operating in one state. If you are operating in one state, it could be dozens or hundreds, right? Because even though the state of Georgia or the state of California may have a portal and they do, that doesn't mean that every entity in the state is using that portal. And a lot of people don't realize that change management in tracking opportunities is a really big part of it, Mike. So for example, you might see something if you live in Georgia and you may see that the city of Atlanta posts everything. And Atlanta is probably a bad example. Let's use Savannah. City of Savannah posts things on the state of Georgia portal. And then all of a sudden, there's a new regime for purchasing and they decide to do their own website and they're no longer publishing their bids on the Georgia portal. They're publishing them on their own site or on a third party platform. So change management is a big part of it and recognizing that how particular buyers are posting bids today may not be how they're doing it in six months. At the state level, you know, dozens to hundreds. At the regional level, hundreds. And if you're interested in hearing about leads nationally, it's literally thousands of websites. That's just mind boggling. I can't even wrap my head around somebody who's trying to learn GovCon and trying to learn hundreds or thousands of websites. We typically use two, three, four websites when we're doing stuff. That's usually the the most. And it's still, it's painful for a lot of folks to have yeah. to do that, right? And like you said, you know, we've pulled spending data from people and all of a sudden you, like if you use USA Spending, you'll all of a sudden notice like, oh, they have one contract, but they have 19 grants. <laughs> or, oh, they had COVID money. That's why this number is so big, right? And there aren't a lot of contracts for them. If you're just pulling it blindly from like Sam, where you don't have the simple tabs to flip over, you may not know how to interpret the data is one of the things I think a lot of people struggle with. They're like, wow, this company did $25 million last year. I'm like, no, 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 most of that's grant money and some sort of PPP loan or whatever it is, right? Back so, to the so concept of an award, right? Yeah, it's an award. Well, you know, a GSA is an award. They've got their awarded their GSA schedule. So there's a one in that column, but there's zero dollars, right? That's what comes with it. I want to talk about how you guys attack this problem. So how did you with my GovWatch, how did you attack this problem and solve it through your portal? You mean nationally sled and federal or federal? Let's talk both. Okay, I would say for federal data, obviously the lion's share is coming from SAM.gov and we're gonna get back into that as far as how things are categorized on mm -hmm. SAM.gov, so I don't wanna delve into that yet. But at the state and local market, it starts to become a challenge of understanding where do people live in the United States and what does that mean in terms of tracking opportunities and having visibility to where opportunities are posted? There are 23,000 different census places in the United States, but it turns out that the lion's share of people in this country live in a small number of those. And then you start trying to figure mm. out like, what are the database relationships that need to be in place to manage the data? Because it's one thing to know that buyer A posts on three different websites. It's another thing to have a data system that is able to suck that data in and act as a traffic cop to know where the duplicates are, because in many cases they're posting the same lead in three different places. Mm. So our system is able to figure out, for the most part, if they're posting in multiple places, where's the duplication, and then intelligently route those leads to people based on keywords, artificial intelligence, NAICS codes, all that kind of thing. 
You mentioned NAICS codes there. You did, I think it was a YouTube video on the NAICS codes thing, or, or was it a report where you guys talk about how a lot of the NAICS codes that are assigned are wrong. Can you talk about that real quick? Because yeah. I think that's a really good point for a lot of people to understand how often that happens and how to navigate that. Absolutely. And this is something that went back to, I think, April, we announced it. We're continuously looking at data coming from the SAMGov website, for example. And we started noticing that the way our system was categorizing things could be improved upon. And the way we sort of discovered a large number of SAMGov items have a misassigned NICS code, we discovered that by analyzing you know large data sets and we saw that for let's say an average number of a thousand opportunities posted on samgov per day up to 40 percent of them will have either a flat out incorrect NICS code or something that's easily challenged by an interested party that would like to challenge that NICS code what's really interesting about that too is that for whatever reason they seem to do a better job of assigning a NICS code to products versus services so when you start looking at that, you'll see that maybe three out of four product purchases may have a correct NAICS code or something that seems reasonable, but only about half of service purchases have a NAICS code that would not be subject to questioning. What is your advice on navigating that, given the fact that there's so much of that that's wrong? Like, how do you navigate that through searching for opportunities and things like that? What we tell people is that if they are not using a website like ours that just sends them what they need to see every day, and if you decide that you're only interested in federal purchasing and you're going to be searching SAMGov yourself once or twice a week, that's fine. There are many people who do that. You need to find your gold standard for searching. And so what do we mean by a gold standard? You need to understand that fundamentally on the SAMGov site, word searches are not as effective as searching maybe the state of Georgia site or the state of California site. And why is that? If you look at large numbers of titles on SAMGov, the buyers are often naming the opportunities with gobbledygook, just total mm. nonsensical words or things that just don't make sense that even our artificial intelligence can't always figure out. And I think one of the reasons why they're doing that is that they know that they must assign a NAICS code, which is in the regs. Buyers must assign one NAICS code to every opportunity. They're also assigning, uh, assigning the PSC code, the product service code to it as well. And so you need to find your gold standard. So what do we mean by that? If you're searching SAMGA, certainly do a keyword search. We're not saying don't do that, but you have to think of it in terms of Venn diagrams. There's gonna be opportunities that you may only find if you do a keyword search because they've put the wrong NAICS code on it or they put the wrong product service code or both. So certainly do a keyword search. But then when you realize that's not always going to be effective, you need to know what is your NAICS code, but not only what is your NAICS code, you need to also know what are other NAICS codes that would be likely to be used if someone were to make a mistake. And let me give you a good example of that. We looked at an opportunity when we were writing the article that we'll get back to. This had to do with grazing at a dam and the government wanted a landscaping company to do goat grazing. Most of us are aware that there's goat grazing and that's sort of a landscaping type yeah. these days. So they put the NAICS code for goat farming on the opportunity, Mike. Why do they do that? Well, you may know in the regs that there's something that encourages or requires the buyer to go as far upstream in the supply chain as possible because they assume they're going to get better pricing if they go to the manufacturer, right? They wanted to go to the manufacturer for goats. <laughs> That's awesome. The goat manufacturer. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. So if you are a landscaping company or if you do this niche sort of thing, well, the federal government needs it. They need people with goats to eat the grass and eat the shrubbery. But you can't simply know the NAICS code for landscaping. You need to know that sometimes they're just going to put goat farming. So you need to put that one in. You also will need to put in your product service codes and you know have the same concept for product service code. Know which one applies to you, but also know if they get it wrong, which one would they use. And then the greatest thing that you can know is what would be the combo or what are the combos between NAICS and product service code that would almost guarantee that the item is entirely relevant for you. So for example, there's a NAICS code uh, 334516, Analytical Laboratory Instrument Manufacturing. Uh, and then there's a product service code 6640, Laboratory Equipment and Supplies. When you look at a large data set, what you're gonna see is that 
For whatever reason, that's more than 1% of federal purchasing. More than one out of every 100 items on SamGov, they're buying something for use in a laboratory environment or medical equipment uh, or what have you. So if you know certain useful combinations where NAICS with PSC make sense and align with one another, then you can do those searches on SamGov in tandem. And you will know that with 99.9% .9 certainty, what you're looking at is probably exactly what you do. I like that. You know, one of the things we always talk about, and I said this earlier, was who buys what you sell. But I think the second question is just as important of how they buy what you sell. And you are just answering that, how they buy it. Because people often say, well, they buy it on SAM and they've got to use the right NAICS code, right? I think we just assume for whatever reason, which it's going to sound stupid when this comes out of my mouth, I know it. We assume that the government's going to do everything correctly. We just assume that for some reason and they're people, right? They're people and they've been doing it a long time. And I think one of the challenges I see with the NAICS codes is if you've been doing contracting for 20, 30, 40 years, which happens, right? We run into contracting officers that have been doing this for a long time. They've been using that NAICS code forever. And that's just the NAICS code they continue to use. It doesn't matter if it's been changed or consolidated or whatever, or eliminated. They just keep using it and they keep punching it in the system. Well, you'll go to do a search in SAM. You'll be like, where's the NAICS code? It's not there, but I saw an opportunity for this. So how does that jive, right? So knowing how they're doing it, I think is just as important as who's doing it. It so that you come to the answers that you were talking about here and figure out the goat farming versus landscaping and all that kind of stuff. Because as a landscaper, I'm probably not going to look for that. It's odd to hear the goat farming one though, but I never knew they bought that. And it makes sense with dams and things like that. But anyway, that's an interesting one. Do you have any insight for folks, whether it's either other ways to find who's buying what they're selling or strategies for like setting up the right kind of searches, things like that, whether it's using your tool or something else? Because I think the average person, when they sit down and create their search plan, that's probably a good word for it. Their search plan for what should go in their system. They're looking only at active opportunities and they either have one of two problems. They either have nothing that shows up in the search or they have 450 things that show up in the search. And there's a sweet spot somewhere that's like the right kind of stuff. I think there's no silver bullet to it, Mike. And let me just say a little bit about that. I, I think uh, a lot of times our users or people that we talk to on our webinars or just people we come across, they think that you know there is a certain way of succeeding in government contracting. But I wonder if you'll appreciate and agree with this comment. Success in government contracting is asymmetrical. And I wonder if you agree with that. Yeah, no. absolutely. So the idea that, well, if you just do this, then you're gonna be a government contractor. It's just not true. Certainly one gold standard that we're always telling people, and I know you guys preach this, is that if you can get in front of the opportunity and go to the requirements, that's certainly you know, something that's always advisable. But what we tell people is, look, if you can do that, do it. That's certainly going to be at the forefront of your strategy. But even if you can't do it because your salespeople are you know, tapped out or maybe you don't have salespeople or you know, whatever the case may be, that doesn't mean that you can't simply look for opportunities that are active today. And that's what we tell people, because what we find over and over again when we talk to our users is that getting ahead of the opportunity is not the only way of winning. It's just the best way of having the greatest success of winning. So we see people all the time that are that are bidding on contracts without a relationship. And, you know, we see RFPs all the time that are canceled because no one bid. So when right. I hear that people, there are RFPs where no one bid, that tells me, well, that means that you should have a pipeline of things that you know are coming in the future. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep track of who's buying what you're selling today, either by using our website, a website like ours, looking on SAM, or spending hours of your day searching all the websites in your state or region. That is sort of like the future, like which leads are coming, which leads are out today. But I think another thing people should consider is understanding what's happening within awards through the open records process. And so mm. for those of your listeners who may not be aware of this, you're able to find out either through our website or through your own means, who is winning contracts that you're bidding on. And you can often find out what prices were contracted, what prices were submitted by different bidders, which companies submitted offers on the bid, even a copy of the winning proposal. So as your community of people who are listening to your podcast and people that you know, you're talking to, what they really need is they need access to information and expertise. And one way of cultivating that is by doing open records requests on the back end 
so that you can understand the nature of what's happening in your space. Who are you competing with? Should you be competing with them on price or on value or some capabilities or whatever the case may be? So we're looking at things holistically and saying, try to get ahead of the opportunity, but you should also just be bidding on things where it makes sense by using our site or one like it, and then selectively completing open records requests where it makes sense to keep fingers on the tabs of what's happening. That's really good advice. And I don't think enough people do that. You know, take a look at what other people are doing and their pricing and making those requests that would generate a lot of really valuable intel. I was talking to a client yesterday and he said, well, we're always way overpriced. And I'm like, compared to what? Compared to what? Because like, he's like, well, they just tell us we weren't the lowest bidder. Okay. Compared to what? Like, were you yeah. off by 10% or 75%? And, yeah. and why were you off? You know, one of the things was, did you bid 25 FTEs and they bid 10? Is that why? But you had the exact same pricing. You just overestimated how many people. Well, you know, we, we typically use this particular standard or that standard. And if you're listening and you're one of those people I've had that conversation with, I've probably had that conversation 10 times in the last week alone. So don't necessarily think I'm singling you out because a lot of times people are not looking at what other people are doing. They're looking at their RFP and going, okay, well, this is, you know, where we made our mistakes and that kind of stuff. If you're only looking at yours, but not looking at the winners, how can you know what to do next time? Right. So I think that's really important. It, it would be interesting to know, and I don't know if you know this data, it would be interesting to know how many contracts or what the unused, unspent money number is of things that got canceled because there were no bidders. That would be really interesting to know. And it would be really interesting if you could also try track maybe so this is maybe a if it's not something in there a really interesting feature of a tool to be able to judge how many people are likely to bid on an opportunity. Some friends of ours down in Texas who have a construction system, and I don't know how the thing works, but it basically looks for these specific smaller construction opportunities. It somehow knows how to label which ones are likely to only have, you know, less than three bidders or, mm -hmm. you know, something like that so that you can bid on those instead of the ones that are likely to have, you know, dozens of bidders and things like that. That'd be a really interesting feature. Do you have any thoughts on what the sweet spot is potentially for contracts where I don't have any intelligence, I haven't ghosted anything, I don't really know the company, but they are active opportunities. Do you have any thoughts on how to choose the right ones of those to bid at. Cause we have some thoughts on it around like the bigger, like you shouldn't be bidding a hundred million dollar contract, right? You don't know anything about them. You shouldn't be doing that. But I was wondering if you, if you have any thoughts on that as we kind of wrap up today. Yeah, I would say size definitely would be a factor there. What we see is that, you know, smaller opportunities are going to have fewer bidders. So that certainly will be dependent upon the industry that you're operating in, the type of buyer. So at the state and local level, you're far more likely, I think, to see things that that have very few bidders and we see this all the time where there might be three or four bidders for a county contract or a city contract or even a state contract. The time of year, I think that matters as well. When there are so many RFPs in the first half of the year, even the big boys can't get to all of them, right? Mm. So that would be an opportunity for people to look at things where price is a significant part of the scoring. I'm not saying to always compete on price or only bid on things that are low bid contracts, but you know, if price is half of the scoring, you may win even if they have a preference for someone else, if you have the capability. So that would be another opportunity to look at things along those lines. I would say that those are some things that people should be looking at. Sound advice there. And I hadn't really thought about the timing one though. That's a really good one. So as we start to wrap up here today, I would love for folks to hear a little bit more about my gov watch. So why don't you give us the 60 second infomercial on what you do and how you help companies with your solution? If anybody's interested, we'll have the links and stuff in the description, but I'd love for them to hear from you kind of that infomercial on how the tool helps. Thank you for the opportunity, Mike. I would say that people who are maybe watching or listening later should realize that when you are looking at different data tools out there. There are price points under $1,000, and then there are the legacy providers that can be you know, $10,000 or more. If you're looking for a solution that gives you the most leads at the best price point, you really should be looking at us as one uh, of the options. We have a 14-day free trial. There's no annual contract. People love our user interface. There's 24 different buyer types. So this is not just the federal government. This is state government. This is every local type of government, anything from a school district to a sewer authority to a utility district everything, airports, you name it. That's really the driving force is finding what are you looking to spend 
because you can spend anywhere in that spectrum that you'd mm -hmm. like. What price point do you want to get in at? And then identify what are the features that will give you the most for the spending that you're willing to commit to this type of data product. That's good advice. I'd love to dive in more on the tool. So we'll probably do that offline, but thanks for coming on today and talking about this. I think some really important points on finding who buys what you sell, some interesting data around goat farming. That was fun. I like that one. Thanks again, Nick. I really appreciate it. I really hope you enjoyed the podcast today. If you did, I would really appreciate it if you would like and subscribe to the podcast and screenshot it and tag me on LinkedIn or whatever social media you use. So thank you again for joining us today and we'll see you next time.